Chapters 7 and 8 of The Book of Life by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 Making Our Morals Attempts to show that human morality must change to fit human facts, and there can be no judge of it save human reason. Assuming the arguments of the preceding chapters to be accepted, it appears that human life is in part at least a product of human will, guided by human intelligence. Man finds himself in the position of the crew of a ship in the middle of the ocean. He does not know exactly how the ship was made or how it came to be in its present position, but he has discovered how the engines are run and how the ship is steered and the meaning of the compass. So now he takes charge of the ship, and keeps it afloat amid many perils, and meantime on the bridge of the vessel there goes on a furious argument over the question what port the ship shall be steered to, and what chart shall be used. It is not well as a rule to trust to similes, but this simile is useful because it helps us to realize how fluid and changeable are the conditions of man's life, and how incessant and urgent the problems with which he finds himself confronted. The moral and legal codes of mankind may be compared to the steering orders which are given to the helmsman of the vessel. Northeast by north, he is told and if during the night a heavy wind arises and pushes the bow of the vessel off to the starboard, then the helmsman has to push the wheel in the opposite direction. If he does not do so, he may find that his vessel has swung round and is going to some other part of the world. Next morning the passengers may wake up and find the ship is on the rocks, because the helmsman persisted in following certain steering directions which were laid down in an ancient Hebrew book two or three thousand years ago. If life is a continually changing product, then the laws which govern conduct must also be continually changing, and morality is a problem of continuous adjustment to new circumstances and new needs. If man is free to work upon this changing environment, he must be free to make new tools and devise new processes. If it is the task of reason to choose among many possible courses and many possible varieties of life, then clearly it is man's duty to examine and revise every detail of his laws and customs and moral codes. This is, of course, in flat contradiction to the teachings of all religions. So far as I know, there is no religion which does not teach that the conduct of man in certain matters has been eternally fixed by some higher power, and that it is man's duty to conform to these rules. It is considered to be wicked even to suggest any other idea. In fact, to do so is the most wicked thing in the world far more dangerous than any actual infraction of the code, whatever it may be. Let us see how this works out in practice. Let us take, for a test, the Ten Commandments. These commandments were given upon stone tablets some four thousand years ago, and are supposed to have been valid ever since. Thou shalt not kill is one. Others phrase it, thou shalt do no murder and in this double version we see at once the beginnings of controversy. If you are a Quaker, you accept the former version, while if you are a member of the military general staff of your country, you accept the latter. You maintain the right to kill your fellow men, provided that those who do the killing have been previously clad in a special uniform, indicating their distinctive function as killers of their fellow men. You maintain, in other words, the right of making war, and presently, when you get into making war, you find yourself maintaining the right to kill, not merely by the old established method of the sword and the bullet, but by means of poison gases, which destroy the lives of women and children, perhaps a whole city full at a time. 
and also of course you maintain the right to kill provided the killing has been formally ordered and sanctioned by a man who sits upon a raised bench and wears a black robe and perhaps a powdered wig you consider that by the simple device of putting this man into a black robe and a powdered wig you endow him with the authority to judge and revise the divine law in other words you subject this divine law to human reason and if some religious fanatic refuses to be so subjected you call him by the dread name pacifist and if he attempts to preach his idea you send him to prison for ten twenty years which means in actual practice that you kill him by the slow effects of malnutrition and tubercular infection if he is ordered to put on the special costume of killing and refuses to do so you call him a c o and you bully and beat him and perhaps administer to him the water cure in your dungeons or take the commandment that we shall not commit adultery surely this is a law about which we can agree but presently we discover that unhappily married couples desire to part and that if we do not allow them to part we actually cause the commission of a great deal more adultery than otherwise therefore our wise men meet together and revise this divine law and decide that it is not adultery if a man takes another wife provided he has received from a judge an engraved piece of paper permitting him to do so but some of the followers of religion refuse to admit this right of mere mortal man the catholic church attempts to enforce its own laws and declares that people who divorce and remarry are really living in adultery and committing mortal sin the episcopal church does not go quite so far as that it allows the innocent party in the divorce to remarry other churches are content to accept the state law as it stands is it not manifest that all these groups are applying human reason and nothing but human reason to the interpreting and revising of their divine commandments or take the law thou shalt not steal surely we can all agree upon that let us do so but our agreement gets us nowhere because we have to set up a human court to decide what is stealing is it stealing to seize upon land and kill the occupants of it and take the land for your own and hand it down to your children forever yes of course that is stealing you say but at once you have to revise your statement it is not stealing if it was done a sufficient number of years ago in that case the results of it are sanctified by law and held unchangeable forever also we run up against the fact that it is not stealing if it is done by the state by men who have been dressed up in the costume of killers before they commit the act again is it stealing to hold land out of use for speculation while other men are starving and dying for lack of land to labor upon some of us call this stealing but we are impolitely referred to as radicals and if we venture to suggest that anyone should resist this kind of stealing we are sentenced to slow death from malnutrition and tubercular infection again is it stealing for a victim of our system of land monopoly to take a loaf of bread in order to save the life of his starving child the law says that this is stealing and sends the man to jail for this act yet the common sense of mankind protests and i have heard a great many respectable americans venture so far in radicalism as to say that they themselves would steal under such circumstances one could pile up illustrations without limit but this is enough to make clear the point that it is perfectly futile to attempt to talk about divine rules for human conduct regardless of any ideas you may hold or any wishes you are forced at every hour of your life to apply your reason to the problems of your life 
and you have no escape from the task of judging and deciding. All that you do is to judge right or to judge wrong, and if you judge wrong, you inflict misery upon yourself and upon all who come into contact with you. How much more sensible, therefore, to recognize the fact of moral and intellectual responsibility, to investigate the data of life with which you have to deal, the environment by which you are surrounded, and to train your judgment so that you will be able to fit yourself to it with quickness and certainty. But, the believer in religion will say, this leaves mankind without any guide or authority. How can human beings act? How can they deal with one another if there are no laws, no permanent moral codes? The answer is that to accept the idea of the evolution of morality does not mean at all that there will be no permanent laws and working principles. Many of the facts of life are fixed for all practical purposes. The purposes not merely of your life and my life, but the life of many generations. We are not likely to see in our time the end of the ancient Hebrew announcement that the sins of the father are visited upon the children. Therefore, it is possible for us to study out of a course of action based upon the duty of every father to hand down to his children the gift of a sound mind in a sound body. The Catholic Church has had for a thousand years or more the mortal sin of gluttony upon its list, and today comes experimental science with its new weapons of research and discovers auto-intoxication and the hardening of the arteries, and makes it very unlikely that the moral codes of men will ever fail to list gluttony as a mortal sin. Indeed, science has added to gluttony not merely drunkenness, but all use of alcoholic liquor for beverage purposes. We have done this in spite of the manifest fact that the drinking of wine was not merely an Old Testament virtue, but a New Testament religious rite. To say that human life changes, and that new discoveries and new powers make necessary new laws and moral customs, is to say something so obvious that it might seem a waste of paper and ink. Man has invented the automobile, and has crowded himself into cities, and so has to adopt a rigid set of traffic regulations. So far as I know, it has never occurred to any religious enthusiast to seek in the book of Revelation for information as to the advisability of the left-hand turn at Broadway and 42nd Street, New York, at five o'clock in the afternoon. But modern science has created new economic facts, just as unprecedented as the automobile. It has created new possibilities of spending and new possibilities of starving for mankind. It has made new cravings and new satisfactions, new crimes and new virtues. And yet the great mass of our people are still seeking to guide themselves in their readjustments to these new facts by ancient codes which have no more relationship to these facts than they have to the affairs of Mars. I am acquainted with a certain lady, one of the kindest and most devoted souls alive, who seeks to solve the problems of her life and of her large family of children and grandchildren according to sentences which she picks out, more or less at random, from certain more or less random chapters of ancient Hebrew literature. This lady will find some words which she imagines apply to the matter, and will shut her devout eyes to the fact that there are other texts bearing on the matter which say exactly the opposite. She will place the strangest and most unimaginable interpretations upon the words, and yet will be absolutely certain that her interpretation is the voice of God speaking directly to her. If you try to tell her about socialism, she will say, The poor ye have always with you, which means that it is interfering with the divine providence to try to remedy poverty on any large scale. This lady is ready instantly to relieve any single case of want. She regards it as her duty to do this, 
in fact she considers that the purpose of some people's poverty is to provide her with a chance to do the noble action of relieving it you would think that the meaning of the sentence spare the rod and spoil the child would be so plain that no one could mistake it but this good lady understood it to mean that god forbade the physical chastisement of children and preferred them spoiled she held this idea for half a lifetime until it was pointed out to her that the sentence was not in the bible but in hudibra an old english poem end of chapter seven chapter eight the virtue of moderation attempts to show that wise conduct is an adjustment of means to an end and depends upon the understanding of a particular set of circumstances some years ago i used to know an ardent single tax propagandist who found my way of arguing intensely irritating because as he phrased it i had no principles we would be discussing for example a protective tariff and i would wish to collect statistics but discovered to my bewilderment that to my single tax friend a customs duty was stealing on the part of the government the government had a right to tax land because that was the gift of nature but it had no right to tax the products of human labor and when it took a portion of the goods which anyone brought into a country the government was playing the part of a robber of course such a man was annoyed by the suggestion that in the early stages of a country's development it might possibly be a good thing for the country to make itself independent and self-sufficient by encouraging the development of its manufactures that on the other hand when these manufacturers had grown to such a size that they controlled the government it might be an excellent thing for the country to subject them to the pressure of foreign competition in order to lower their value as a preliminary to socializing them the reader who comes to this book looking for hard and fast rules of life will be disappointed it would be convenient if someone could lay down for us a moral code and lift from our shoulders the inconvenient responsibility of deciding about our own lives there may be persons so weak that they have to have the conditions of their lives thus determined for them but i am not writing for such persons i am writing for adult and responsible individuals and i bear in mind that every individual is a separate problem with separate needs and separate duties there are of course a good many rules that apply to everybody in almost all emergencies but i cannot think of a single rule that i would be willing to say i would apply in my life without a single exception thou shalt not kill is a rule that i have followed so far without exception but as soon as i turn my imagination loose i can think of many circumstances under which i should kill I remember discussing the matter with a pacifist friend of mine, an out-and-out -out religious non-resistant. I pointed out to him that people sometimes went insane, and in that condition they sometimes seized hatchets and killed anyone in sight. What would my pacifist friend do if he saw a maniac attacking his children with a hatchet? It did not help him to say that he would use all possible means short of killing the maniac he had finally to admit that if he were quite sure it was a question of the life of the maniac or the life of the child he would kill and this is not mere verbal quibbling because such things do happen in the world and people are confronted with such emergencies and they have to decide and no rule is a general rule if it has a single exception there is a saying that the exception proves the rule but this is very silly it is a mistranslation of the latin word probat which means not proves but tests no exception can prove a rule what the exception does is to test the rule by showing that the result does not follow 
in the exceptional case. The only kind of rule which can be laid down for human conduct is a rule in such general terms that it escapes exceptions by leaving the matter open for every man's difference of opinion. Any kind of rule which is specific will sooner or later pass out of date. Take, by way of illustration, the ancient and well-established virtue of frugality. Obviously, under a state of nature or of economic competition, it is necessary for every man to lay by a store for a rainy day. But suppose we could set up a condition of economic security under which society guaranteed to every man the full product of his labor, and the old and the sick were fully taken care of, then how foolish a man would seem who troubled to acquire a surplus of goods. It would be as if we saw him riding on horseback through the main street of our town in a full suit of armor. I devote a great deal of space to this question of a fixed and unchangeable morality, because it is one of the heaviest burdens that mankind carries upon its back. The record of human history is sickening, not so much because of blood and slaughter, but because of fanaticism, because wherever the mind of man attempts to assert itself, to escape from the blind rule of animal greed, it adopts a set of formulas and proceeds to enforce them, regardless of the consequences, upon the whole of life. Consider, for example, the rule of the Puritans in England. The Puritans glorified conscience, and it is perfectly proper to glorify conscience, but not to the entire suppression of the beauty-making faculties in man. Mockley summed up the Puritan point of view in the sentence that they objected to bear-baiting, not because it gave pain to the bear, but because it gave pleasure to the spectators. As a result of applying that principle, and lacing mankind in a straitjacket by legislation, England swung back into a reaction under the Cavaliers in which debauchery held more complete sway than ever before or since in English life. This is a hard lesson, but it must be learned. There is no virtue that does not become a vice if it is carried to extremes. There is no virtue that does not become a vice if it is applied at the wrong time, or under the wrong circumstances, or at the wrong stage of human development. In fact, we may say that most vices are virtues misapplied. The so-called natural vices are simply natural impulses carried to excess, while the unnatural vices result from the suppression and distortion of natural impulses. The Greeks had as their supreme virtue what they called sophrosune. It is a beautiful word, worth remembering. It means a beautiful quality called moderation. We shall find, as we come to investigate, that life is a series of compromises among many different needs, many different desires, many different duties, and reason sits as a wise and patient judge and appoints to each its proper portion, and denies to it an excess which would starve the others. Such is true morality, and it is incompatible with the existence of any fixed code, whether of human origin or divine. The fixed morality is a survival of a far-off past, of the days of instinct and servitude. Human reason has developed, but slowly, and perhaps only a few people are as yet entirely capable of taking control of their own destiny. Perhaps it is really dangerous to think for oneself. But if we investigate carefully, we may decide that the danger is not so much to ourselves as it is to others. The most evil of all the habits that man has inherited from his far-off past is the habit of exploiting his fellows. And in order to exploit them more safely, the ruling castes of priests and kings and nobles and property owners 
have taken possession of the moralities of the world and shaped them for their own convenience they have taught the slave virtues of credulity and submission they have surrounded their teachings with all the terrors of the supernatural they have placed upon rebellion the penalties not merely of this world but of the next not merely of the dungeon and the rack but of hellfire and brimstone i do not wish to go to extremes and say that the moral codes now taught in the world are made wholly in this evil way as a matter of fact they are a queer jumble of the two elements the slave terrors of the past and the common sense of the present there is not one moral code in the world today there are many there is one for the rich and an entirely different one for the poor and the rich have had a great deal more to do with shaping the code of the poor than the poor have had to do with shaping the code of the rich there is one code for governments and an entirely different one for the victims of governments there is one code for business and an entirely different one a far more human and decent one for friendship above all there is one code for sunday and another code for the other six days of the week most of our idealisms and our sentimental fine phrases we reserve for our sunday code while for our everyday code we go back to the rule of the jungle dog eat dog or do unto others as they would do unto you but do it first when you attempt to suggest a new moral code to our present-day moral authorities it is the fine phrases of the sunday code they bring out for exhibition purposes and perhaps you are impressed by their arguments until monday morning when you attempt to apply this code at the office and they stare at you in bewilderment or burst out laughing in your face what i am trying to do here is to outline a code that will not be a matter of phrases but a matter of practice it will apply to all men rich as well as poor and to all seven days of the week i am not so much suggesting a code as pointing out to you how you can work out your own code for yourself i am suggesting that you should adopt it not because i tell you to but because you yourself have taken it and tested it precisely as you would test any other of the practical affairs of your life potatoes is an article of diet or some particular sack of potatoes that a peddler was trying to sell you it is not yet possible for you to be as sure about everything in your life as you can be about the sack of potatoes human knowledge has not gone that far but at least you can know what is to be known and if anything is a matter of uncertainty you can know that such knowledge is often the most important of all just as the driver of an automobile wants to know if a bridge is not to be depended on so i say to you that if you want to find happiness in this life look with distrust upon all absolutes and ultimates all hard and fast rules all formulas and dogmas and general principles bear in mind that there are many factors in every case there are many complications in every human being there are many sides to every question try to keep an open mind and an even temper try to take an interest in learning something new every day and in trying some new experiment this is the scientific attitude toward life this is the way of growth and of true success it is inconvenient because it involves working your brains and most people have not been taught to do this and find it the hardest kind of work there is but how much better it is to think for yourself and to protect yourself than to trust your thinking to some group of people whose only interest may be to exploit you for their advantage end of chapter 8 end of section 4